if you think of ETH as the Android economy and Solana is more like Apple, it's like a single operating system, but a very good one. You know, I'm looking at risk rewards here. And I'm just thinking, could this be the ETH of this cycle? Solana is off to a strong start in 2024. Come through a bleed surpassing the $100 mark after a bullish finish line in 2023. Starting its upward journey from $10, Solana's growth is supported by its network expansion, which continues to boost its impressive rise. Enthusiasts are wondering if Solana will be able to regain the $200 price level by the end of 2024. Although Solana reached an all-time high of $259.96 in November 2021, it suffered subsequent losses and even fell below $10 following the collapse of FTX crypto exchange. While Solana last hit $200 in December 2021, market participants are speculating on its potential to reach that price again this year. In today's video, we will tell you about Raul Pals view on Solana is he thinks that Solana will go beyond our imagination in 2024. But before we get into the video, make sure you subscribe to our channel and press that bell icon to never miss an update. This is the recession that was ignored last year. Crypto assets are not down 80%. The Nasdaq fell 35%. Long-term growth technologies like ARK fell 78%. It was the recession. So we have forward-looking markets because they now understand liquidity cycles. This is why they are increasing and liquidity is slowly returning. So even if the Fed does quantitative tightening and issuance of treasuries because of this reduction in these reverse repos, all that means is that they haven't tightened liquidity in a long time because there is a lot of debt that needs to be settled, be refinanced. Every three to five years, we have this four-year cycle. The reason is that they all reset interest rates to zero in 2009. And we've been on this four-year cycle ever since. The entire economy follows it. This is also the halving cycle. It's all the same. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet is three and a half years behind on interest payments due compared to the previous cycle. There is no way to manage an economy growing so slowly with so much debt. If you had a faster growing economy, that would be great. But if we say that the economy grows after a year and a half, the trend rate of economic growth is around 1.7%. The U.S. government has a debt around 120% of GDP. And interest rates, if they are above 1.5%, mean that all economic activity is just paying interest. The U.S. government's debt problem comes from the private sector. They represent more than 100% of GDP and debt. So what happens is the Fed monetizes all the government debt four or three and a half years later, and the private sector does its job. But the GDP growth is just not enough. And that's what we're seeing in the market. This is what is happening here. Governments depend on the money we invest in them, taxes and other things, so we don't have enough taxes because the economy is too slow to pay the interest on the debt. What is being done is devaluing the currency and pooling the debt between losses. Everyone socializes, and the only people who socialize losses, and the only people who manage to compensate for them, are those who can buy the rarest assets. So if you divide the S&P 500 by the Fed's balance sheet, it's pretty much stable since 2008. Gold is stable, real estate is stable, there are only two assets that have outperformed the balance sheet, namely cryptocurrencies and technology, as both are in exponential growth phases. GDP growth is measured by growth in population, productivity, and debt. We have completed the debt growth game. Population growth? No one will have more children because everything is like that. So there are no more children, so productivity must be achieved. But this AI does two things. First, it's like endless new people, endless new workers, endless knowledge workers, and then comes the robots. They are infinite physical workers, so it's like an infinite population. Well, that's a really interesting concept, and that leads to productivity. There is a sense that new capital is coming into the space because it is deviating from the risk curve. So we saw Bitcoin rise in the first part of what we call the crypto spring. So the whole year was Bitcoin, and that was due just to alternate bleeding. But what we're starting to see is a shift towards ETFs, which also raise capital from other people, hedge funds, and the like. And then finally, the news that BlackRock has probably started buying them. Who knows how much that is, but let's say it's a few hundred million dollars anyway. So the ETF way of thinking is really useful. This is the crypto economy, and it has recently been starved of new capital. An ETF is a trade agreement between TradeFi economy and this new economy, so we just concluded a trade deal. 
This doesn't mean we're going to have trade, but it looks like we're going to start attracting foreign direct investment into the crypto economy. Solana, Chainlink, and others are starting to rise as capital enters the space and people place risky bets on things they think might work in the cycle. You've been given a gift. You can buy a fractional asset and become a multimillionaire. Or you can make $200 a week and you can invest 10% of your money in it because it's fractional. And it is the first truly global asset. It's the same for Brazilians and Indians like Philadelphia. It's an asset. It empowers people. So there is a possibility. What you want to do is compare things to Bitcoin and see where things are currently. Ethereum has always been very interesting to me because the entire bear cycle did not fall 90% compared to Bitcoin. Many existing alternatives do this because we know it's a huge ecosystem. Everything changed when the high activity became deflationary because in reality, high activity occurs in a bull market. This, therefore, becomes rarer in a bull market. The other thing is now gold has a yield, and if you think about institutions, they like things that have a yield. So they don't like gold because it doesn't have a yield. Ethereum does it. So Ethereum was the biggest bet. So we have Solana, supposedly at 65,000 TPS. We have Layer 2, like a roughly equal polygon, but less secure than Layer 1. This is a Solana layer that is 20 times. So they say it's fast enough to power the entire securities industry. Twitter only runs at 24,000 TPS, so you can manage all the social networks, do high-frequency trading, you can do it all. What we're trying to do is, if we're in this horrible economic world, we want to try to make as many chips as possible when we can. That's the game. Now, you might be the Bitcoin maximalist who doesn't want to hold on to all the tokens. There is no problem with these different worlds. NFTs are just one asset in the Ethereum economy. If we compare the stock market versus the real estate sector, the stock market has outperformed the real estate sector by approximately 18 months. And the interesting thing is that the crypto cycle is the same as the economic cycle. So going over this matter with Solana, they have broken the NFT squeeze, which means they can create a million NFTs for $100. They have a channel that is stupidly cheap and stupidly fast. An NFT is therefore just a contract that lives on a chain. Everything is derivative. Everything is contract. And they can all be unique, but also invoices. All invoices. When tickets like this are issued, they cost less than printed tickets, and that enables a lot of use cases that we've never done before. And having a chain that fast, if it turns out to be correct, means you can use it for trades, which you couldn't do before because blockchains were too slow. The high-frequency trading industry is only about one thing. They are fighting one thing, the speed of light. They have fiber optic cables and try to transmit the information to the central office and send it back as close to the speed of light as possible. So what these jump trading guys are saying is that they're trying to get to the speed of light, so they just need to create a channel that can do that. And if they can do that, then they can do high frequency trading. And if they succeed, it means that everything that happens in financial markets can be settled on chain. And this is the big turning point, decoupling this concentrated risk and decentralizing it. That's all for today. Let us know your views in the comment section below, and don't forget to like this video before leaving. Thanks for watching.